This conference will now be recorded. Last week, All right. Um, oh, yeah. 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 This is Dr. Alicia Seifer from the Prince William Sound Science Center. She's going to talk to us about the oil effects on your Oh, welcome, crowd. Can't um, So this talk's going to be uh, about some work that I did. Before coming here, I worked in Seattle with the Northwest Fishery Science Center, and we looked at the effects of oil on young herring. And um, see? <laughs> And uh, so this will be what I learned, some of the data I got there, but in the context of what I've learned since I've been at the science event. Um, events. So uh, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with the hair and life cycle, but they're an adult forage fish. They lay eggs in near shore vegetation, and they uh, hatch out in about 10 to 14 days, depending on temperature. Uh, and then the larvae are like totally at the mercy of the current. So they just kind of float where they can. Hopefully they end up in bays where they're relatively protected. And then around 80 days, 90 days, 100 days, they'll uh, metamorphose into a juvenile stage where that's when their scales come on. And then uh, then the big thing is survive your first winter. And then uh, they'll become their length. And then um, at three to four years, sexually mature recruit into the spine population and become adults. And historically, uh, Prince William Sound had, you know, fairly good um, uh, spawning coverage. You know, the Western Sound, even some on Night Island here, Naked Island. Um, but then, but then, it changed. <laughs> so then, got about these hostile. It was kind of the start of this escalation, at least in time time frame. Uh, so Tanger ran aground at Fly Reef, emptied 11 million gallons of oil. And we're coming up on what 32, 30, I'm not going to do the math now, 34. 34. Um, yeah, older than me. Um, so, uh, all that old, the days after the spill, the response was relatively slow, and, uh, and then some storms came in and started pushing all the oil towards the, the southwest. And this just happened to coincide with uh, when herring were spawning. So there were adult herring in the area, and there were eggs in the area also. Um, and so there were observations of like oil eggs and some damaged larva showing time, signs of oil toxicity at the time of the spill. But the consensus around that time was that the adult spawning population was going to be okay. And they were kind of right for a minute. Um, so here we have. Uh, 89 biomass was at an all-time high, and then there's a you know slight decrease after, but these were peak biomasses, and so that was not a cause of concern that it was you know kind of fluctuating. Uh, but in 1993, a fraction of the population returned to spawn, and that is what is deemed the collapse, and that was 1993. And if we went from about 140,000 tons of biomass, about 20, and we've never recovered that. But since then. We've learned a lot about how oil affects fish because the question was, did the oil cause the collapse? And so we now know that herring during early life stages are super, super sensitive to oil exposure. Uh, we end up with these uh, really ugly malformations at not very high concentrations in reality. You and I could drink the water and probably be okay. I feel a little funny, but. Um, so we, some of these are called bulldog and dark fader, and I think that's an actually a manuscript that those phenotypes are called. And uh, and this is associated with very high mortality because having a face like that is not conducive with life if you want to eat and, and continue to develop. And so some of these malformations were observed after the, uh, the oil spill, but oh yeah. <clears throat> so before continue. Uh, when I talk about concentrations, I'm talking about polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So oil is made up of a lot of hydrocarbons and a, a lot of different compounds, and it's this really intense mixture. Uh, but polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PHs, are what we consider to be the source of a lot of toxicity when you, it comes to marine fish exposures. Uh, and there's a lot of different compounds 
involved in this. Mainly, they just have um, multiple rings, uh, and that's all you really need to know about them. A lot of people are doing a lot of research on PDHs and toxicity and other things, and it gets super complicated if you expose a fish to PAHs or oil in their sunlight, that changes things, if there's bacteria, that changes things, and then if a fish is metabolizing these compounds, they're changing them themselves, and so there's so many like interactions, toxicity, and you could bang your head against the wall about it, but we just tend to look at it as a cumulative PAH metric, and that's what I'm telling you. So let's, let's look at this in, in the context of uh, so here's a range of like pHs that you might see in an environmental setting or a lab setting. Lab setting would tend to they tend to go higher. Um, so if you take an adult herring <clears throat> and you expose them to some crude oil, we really don't see much um, toxicity until about 27-ish um, parts per billion or micrograms per liter, which is a small amount. And what they, you know, something that they see that one paper is seen is like liver lesions, and then they also accumulate the pHs in their ovaries, which is mostly because their ovaries are fatty, and, um, but it's also a good way to get rid of toxins is put them in your babies and get rid of them. And so there's damage to the eggs. Not a lot of mortality associated with this kind of exposure. So adult herring in general are fairly hardy to an oil exposure. But if you take an embryo or a larva herring, and then you expose them to two, five, four, ten parts per million, they get progressively uglier. Uh, and so a lot of these phenotypes that we see are associated with increasing mortality. So less and less of these embryos and larvae will survive. They got smaller eyes, their, their spines are super curved, and their faces are just really distorted, and uh, a lot of them die. One more. And so if we look at what was happening during the eggs on the eagle spill, there were a few teams that went out and sampled the water at various stations and measured pHs. And you know, the highest number I could find was 42 parts per billion identified by a paper, but that was one site. They said there was an oil sheen, seemed to be high. Uh, and the average was about 6.24 or 0.2, depending on who was funding your data collection. <laughs> So there's not a lot of um, corroboration on what the concentrations were at the time. There's been review papers since that say, like, well, we, because everybody's saying different things, do we really know what happened? So if you, but if you do expose that herring to a low concentration, like two parts per billion, they, a number of them will survive, and but they're not like in the best shape. So here's some uh, herring larvae. You know, shortly after hatch, they still have a yolk sac, and these are all oil exposed. So this this one is a 0.07, so that's very low. And this is a fairly typical looking hair larva, hair larva. And then as you increase the pHs, and we're only going to four, you got 1.3, 1.9, you can see just by looking at them under the microscope that something's changing. So on this, uh, you know, 4.2, you can see this spine's messed up, uh, and there's a lot of fluid accumulation uh, for the yolk that's in the, uh, the space around the heart, and actually also behind the yolk sac. And he might have a little bit of a jaw malformation going on too. But if you look at the 1.9, again, you can see that there's some compression of the yolk sac, and that's because of fluid accumulating around the heart. And then even here, you can see it. So like, if you look at the first one, there's a nice rounded shape of the yolk, and then this 1.3, it's flattened. So there's still some fluid accumulation going on there. Go ahead. And, uh, and the main concern here is that the fluid accumulation of these low concentrations, that's what we were interested in. So I'm going to tell you about heart development and hair, you're going to love it. So, uh, in all fish really, that was one too. Um, so, during early in embryonic development, you end up with these clusters of cells. And they ultimately become the ventricle or the atrium. So the atrium puts the blood in the ventricle and the ventricle pumps it out. Fish only have an atrium and a ventricle, whereas we have two atrium and ventricles. Uh, so they start off as two sets of uh, clusters of cells, they merge, and then they become this linear tube that I, I can see under a microscope when I'm looking at an embryo. I can see the, the linear tube and I can see the atrium and the ventricle. And then it goes through this looping stage where it kind of twists 
And then after that, the ventricle starts to proliferate, which means it's putting more cells into its ventricle, it's getting bigger, uh, it's gonna thicken up the wall, get ready to do some major contractions. And then this final stage here uh, is called trabeculation, which is you want, ultimately you want a heart that's not completely empty on the inside. You want to have muscle that's, it ends up being like these finger-like um, projectiles inside the heart that add muscle and give a really good contraction for your heart. And so you want that. Um, and then if you expose uh, a hair into oil, what gets messed up is this proliferation part where they're not putting as many cells in their ventricle. They're gonna need them at some point. And then they're not building up the trabeculation. And so their ventricles kind of at best delayed in development or at worst totally disrupted. So I'm gonna go more into this. Um, so this is just another picture of an embryonic heart. That's the atrium. The blood's going to flow through here into the ventricle and out. And <clears throat> good. Yeah, there you go. That's just yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. That I keep thinking I can do this, and it's not working. Um, so, uh, so this is more. This is kind of like the linear heart uh, in embryonic development, and the heart actually starts beating in this phase, even though embryos and larvae of fish do not need their heart to beat for oxygen or to remove CO2 from their body. Like we need that. And when they're bigger, they need that. But when they're young, they don't quite need it yet. Just being in the water, oxygen will diffuse across their cells and into their body and the CO2 will go out through their gills. And so there's a lot of uh, respiration occurring just through their skin and their gills. They don't need the functioning heart just yet. But the fact that the heart starts beating is what drives the rest of the development. Uh, so the heart does need to beat and beat well in order to drive the formation of vessels, the development of the ventricle. It's kind of like exercising it so that it gets stronger and develops. Uh, and so this is all leading up to a, an adult heart that has really nice you know, musculature. It has a, um, an empty space and it can fill it with a lot of blood and then give a good contraction that pushes it all out. And so, Maybe some of you know this, but every muscle contraction in our arms, our heart, is driven by a cascade of salt, basically. So sodium, potassium, calcium, moving across gradients is what drives muscle contractions. And so when you have a contraction occur, the sodium's flowing with its gradient, it's creating this like current of electricity that allows your, your muscles to contract. And then there's a relaxation phase after that where everything has to go back where it was. And usually, and that involves energy, ATP, energy, and light, where you're pumping things back across their concentration gradient. So this is just salt muscle contraction. If you introduce oil, uh, they recently found, a lab in California found, that um, the pHs from oil can bind up some of these gated channels, which are responsible for getting the potassium back out of the cell, getting the calcium back into your sarcoplasmic reticulum. Doesn't matter, it messes this up. And the potassium part ends up leading to a longer rest between contractions. So your heart can't start the next beat because it needs more rest. Uh, and then the calcium, being screwed up will lead to a less strong contraction. So you're not going to be able to push as much blood with that contraction. And then these each lead to, to a longer, yeah, a longer rest leads to an arrhythmia, slower heart rate, and the reduced contraction strength leads to less blood being pumped per heart. And you want it to be fairly efficient. And this can all lead to uh, changes in gene expression, which then lead to the thickening of this trabeculation and kind of an over overindulgence in the cells that build up and not in the way that they're supposed to. And then it can delay um, the, the growth of the ventricle itself. So it's delaying development again of the ventricle. And this leads to, so this is, this is slices of a juvenile heart. This fish was only exposed to oil during its very early life when it was still in the egg. And then it was grown up then it had its heart, its heart ripped out very mercilessly and sliced up in little pieces. And so this is a pretty, this is a very pretty model. 
you can see a lot of black spaces, that's where blood's gonna fill in, and then there's nice coverage of the muscle so that it's gonna give a good contraction and get push that blood. And this heart with an oil exposed heart, and you can see that there's a lot less black space. The lumen is larger, but blood can get stuck in there. The, the, the big gap in the middle, blood can get stuck in there. And there's too much, uh, too many cells in all this area here. So you get uh, less uh, filling capacity for the heart, and then the contraction's not gonna be as good to push it anyway. Uh, so the question that I was working on in Seattle was, okay, if we know all these things, you know, make the heart look different, uh, does that affect the function of a herring who's just trying to live and, and survive out in a place like her is now? <laughs> so this was our experiment. We had this really slick setup. It, it was like this uh, dispersion generator that bubbled oil in the seawater. And then it was a series of like solenoid valves that gave out little doses continuously. So the whole system was flow through and then it just had continuous oil coming in. So that way you're not like, Letting, them, letting the hair make sit in stagnant water, they don't like that. Uh, and the concentrations we had were up to 3.5, so still low. And then um, the ones that we grew out were 1.5, 0.2, and then the control. And again, these fish were only exposed for 10 days. So just embryonic development, and then they went to clean sea water, and they were happy as a clam, not really. Uh, metamorphosis at 80, that's when they get their scales again. And then after that point, we uh, did uh, a swim performance. So I just basically swam them until they gave up on life. And then I did an overwinter survival so uh, study, which was even worse. And uh, basically a hair and torture, even though I love them dearly. Uh, and then throughout this whole thing, we did um, cardiac morphology, assays, we looked at growth, mortality, anything we can, anything we can put a number on. So, historically, that fluid accumulation that I showed you earlier was the main indicator of an oil exposure and whether or not they're messed up or not. And we've since, you know, learning all this new stuff, we've since identified this new parameter that's uh, called posterior ventricle area. And so it's just this tip of the ventricle. But the reason we chose that space, that part of the ventricle, is because that's where a lot of the proliferation is occurring and during larval development. You can literally see it turn into like a boot shape. Uh, and then in the oil fish, you can see that it's not very boot like. Uh, and so far, it's the most sensitive thing identified to date as far as an oil exposure. So, uh, and, you know, if there's a substantial decrease, but it's this um, 0.6 uh, parts per billion pHs is what this scale is for the tissue concentration, but that's 0.6 is the what is in the water. So, okay, we messed up our. Here, good job. And then we grew them out to juvenile stages and looked at a bunch of stuff. And so first, they're smaller. So this is, all my figures look different, so you can please just tell me. Um, this is a, a length uh, distribution um, at 86 days, which is right around the time of metamorphosis. And you can see that, you know, the median on this is about 45 millimeters for the control fish. And then these ones, it's about 27. So they're small. They didn't grow much. <laughs> and then when I swam them in a uh, swim tunnel over the course of two months, 14 hour days, uh, what I was looking for was the speed, it, the average speed at which the herring stuck. So they are swimming in this cute little tunnel and then they give up and they lay on the baffle that prevents them from getting chopped up in the rudder. Uh, and the uh, 1.5 treatment uh, was lower. And I could tell just looking at them that they were not doing as well. And then this was also accompanied by uh, less, like their metabolic rate, which is just how much oxygen they consume, um, was much lower. So that indicates that they could not up their metabolic rate in order to get <coughs> get swimming to compensate for having to do physical activity. So then I did a number of winter survival studies. So they were about 200 days old and um, it was winter time. And the idea was just to fast them until they died. And uh, it took about 80 to 90 days for these fish to start dying. 
Um, so I feel I felt a little bad, but the Iucucca rabbit, which is the animal use in care for guinea, if you don't know. Um, good. So I had fed treatments, these lines up here. So this is the proportion that are still alive. And then the fed ones, you know, a few died, just regular, regular death. Um, and then the starved ones, uh, it took a while for them to start. And then um, this slide is the control fish that were never exposed to oil. And this one is the oil fish. And on average, they died about 12 days sooner, which maybe that doesn't sound like much, but these fish are only 200 days old, and 12 days might mean a lot when you're trying to find food during a rainy winter. Oh, and then they die. <laughs> so uh, we saw, uh, you know, more mortality with the fish that were previously exposed to, to oil throughout their um, time growing to the juvenile stages. So. So I've made a wonderful case for how the oil spill totally screws up herring. Uh, eggs have a uh, higher mortality when they're exposed to oil. Cardiac toxicity has permanent consequences. Uh, same with the larval phase. The juveniles end up smaller, they can't swim as well, and they die sooner in wintertime. So that must be what caused the collapse. No. <laughs> Even though uh, oil causes um, you know, pretty much like a cardiovascular disease in marine fish if they're exposed early enough. Uh, it was not the loss of the 89 year class that caused the collapse. So 1989 was the age class that they were in the water during the spill. And in order to understand this better, we need to think about what drives hair improvement. So hair improvement is driven by strong year classes. So these are uh, age groups a single year of herring that carry the biomass. Uh, and the strong year class at the time of the collapse was the 88 year class. So they would have been a year old at the time of the spill. And so the 1989 year class was never really expected to significantly contribute to improvement. So high mortality in that year class theoretically should not contribute to a collapse of an adult spawning population. Uh, so it was the loss of the 88 year class that resulted in the collapse because they were the ones doing all the spawning and making up most of the biomass. Uh, so here you can see 88. Uh, and this is how many age three herring are coming up that year, the ones joining the spawning population. And you can see a strong year class by that peak and that there, there's a lot of them. And same with uh, 1984 here. And this, uh, go ahead and just make the arrows go. <laughs> so this is a, a age composition survey done by uh, Fish and Game, uh, where they go out each year and they just figure out what are the ages of the herring that are in the water. And this is a good way to uh, demonstrate that um, a, a strong year class dominates the population at that time, and they dominate it throughout through their life. So the bigger circles mean more of that, the sampling at that time point is that age class. So 84 was dominating here, 88, 1999, 2004. And it doesn't really show that 1999, 2004 weren't nearly as big of uh, strong year classes as 84 and 88 were. Uh, so there's little evidence that the 88 year class was really affected by the oil spill. They did recruit and they spawned. 91, 92 were still relatively good years. So what happened? Uh, disease is the leading hypothesis for why herring population collapsed in 93. So after the spill and the collapse, pretty much 89 to 94, there was a uh, sampling where they went out and they collected herring and they're looking for um, signs of disease. So the main one that they did find signs of is viral hemorrhagic septicemia virus, or VHSV, in herring cells. But it's really hard to link the presence of disease in a few fish that you collect out of the sound to a mass mortality event when you didn't see a mass mortality event. They didn't show up to spawn, but there was never like a billion dead herring washing up on our shore. So that's not that anyone could see. Um, and they're in research pertaining to this particular virus. They have not linked it to many mass mortality threat events for that reason. But there is evidence that it can cause greater than 90% mortality. Um, and there's also some research that says that crude oil can affect the herring susceptibility to this disease. And go ahead. Uh, and so this is one exposure that some colleagues of mine did at Maristone Fuel Station with USGS. 
or they're just looking at how many fish die in total. And it's just, they're, both of these lines are virus challenge, oil, no oil. The oil was lower, so they had lower cumulative mortality. But they saw this in one trial, and the next trial they didn't see it. And then they see a different effect. So the answers on this are pretty inconsistent, and um, it seems to be like an influence of temperature, um, timing that the uh, fish are exposed to oil, whether it's during embryonic development, during marble development, and so, <laughs> so why haven't they recovered then? If we don't, if they, okay, so let's say disease is working on the glass, why haven't they recovered? Uh, maybe it's the lingering oil. Uh, so there does remain to be lingering oil at sites in Prince William Sound. And the oil at these sites uh, remains high in BEHs that can cause toxicity despite years of weathering and just being exposed to the elements and that's definitely different than what it, what it was when it was put in the water. Uh, however, these oil deposits are considered bio-unavailable, which means they're buried in sediment. Unless you dig down and get to it, uh, it's not coming up. It's kind of locked down and preserved. Um, also, the sites where there's lingering oil are not the same sites that we're having herring spawn on. So there's very unlikely that we're going to have re-exposure every year of this lingering oil to our herring that are being uh, the herring eggs that are being laid each year. So that's not big. So let's think about herring recruitment again. Maybe it's maybe it's in here. Um, so again, herring have strong ear classes. And uh, if you look at the years that the strong ear classes occur, and you compare it to something like, like Sitka, where they still have a herring fishery, we see that there's a lot of uh, similar years. <laughs> Uh, this indicates that there is some kind of regional influence that might be keeping this uh, consistent between these two sites that are pretty far apart from each other. And then when people think about what, what influences recruitment, like what is the things that go, like what drives recruitment? Is it temperature? Is it this? Is it that? Well, the one thing that and we can definitely say is that leap year, they all occur on leap years for the most part, which is kind of weird. I'm going to steal your joke. They just need that extra day. That's his joke. <laughs> um, and go ahead. <laughs> so even when they skip a year, like 2012 was expected to be a strong year class in Prince William Sound, they showed up as age ones. There was some evidence that they were there at age one, and then they didn't show up. But in 2016, it sinks back up with Sitka. So, what is it? Uh, but the but the just like crippled recruitment and low biomass in Prince William Sound also in itself indicates that there's something local keeping things low, whether or not that's disease or somebody could probably argue the oil. I don't think disease. Um, but the problem is that the Prince William Sound strong year classes are not that strong and they occur less frequently. So what's the answer? I don't know. You know? Well, that's like four years ago when we had our last big herring meeting. Remember that one? That was the same conclusion. Remember that was? I mean, there were all these really smart people. Saying, we don't know. I mean, that's great. Obviously, you've done the work. Let's see that. Yeah, and we, I mean, we've learned a lot, and like the main thing that I take away from all this is that recruitment is extremely, um, like, baffling on what, like, what, now you're absolutely fascinating, and like, what, go ahead, but well, yeah, we learned some stuff in a nutshell, like, the herring recruitment being so complicated is it, just interesting in itself, like, I really liked the oil work, uh, and, but, yeah. So is there no? Um, so this is uh, again recruitment. So it's how many age three you're going in? Uh, 84 again, 88, and then the collapse. And so uh, the 2016 year class doesn't look that sexy when you look at it right there. Um, but when you look at how many spawners were in the water, go ahead to the next one. 
So this is 84 and 88. So this figure down here is basically this figure, but normalized by how much spawning biomass was going on. So theoretically, if you have a lot of spawning biomass, you have a lot of recruits in a few years, like the next few years. But that's not always like that's not generally the case. So 84, 88, 1999. This is 2016. And so there were not there was not a very uh, spectacular spawning event in 2016. But Prince James Sound had two times the number of recruits per spawning biomass than Sitka. So this is the the, um, the 2016 spawning like mile miles here. That's that was all it was, and uh, it was actually almost a record low in spawning mild days of spawn. So not a <laughs> spectacular event, uh, but you know. When we did, this is the one that's not going to work, but when we did, um, so Scott does uh, aerial forage for surveys as part of the Herring Research and Monitoring Program, and so that means they go out uh, when the ECH class is a year old, and they look for juvenile herring schools, they're looking at size, looking at counts, uh, and then um, just reflying the area in June to see where are the schools at, are they there, and so uh, I mean, 2013 was actually a fairly good year because 2012 was looking good. Um, but typically, um, there's if the animation was going. You can see that a lot most years there's not a ton. There's small circles. They're kind of sparse. And then um, you know, thinking about 2016, the, this is the uh, what, what 2017 looked like for parent juvenile parent schools. And so they were there. And then. And then they showed up to spawn uh, when they recruited into the population. And uh, so 2020 was the last leap year, y'all. Cross your fingers and toes. But what's 2021 look like? Looking pretty good. So we'll find out this year, next year, whether or not they're also showing up to spawn. So. In other words, there's still not a lot of herring in the, in the water. We're not seeing a blow up in biomass, but these are all indicators that something good's happening. They're spawning in new locations. They're spawning in new locations that they haven't since the early 90s, like Glacier Island. Uh, the spawn events at Kayak Island have been a hot topic of conversation where there's uh, mile long schools observed and uh, just a lot of white water. Which is good. And then this is the spawn map for uh, 2020, where I mean, in comparison to that 2016 map I showed you, you can see that there's a lot more um, coverage in different areas, and these are all good indicators that. Hold on to your parent permits. That's it. I'm done. I'll let you talk here all the night. <laughs> no, that was really good. I remember vaguely that a similar study 